All right. Um, thank you, Bill, for the kind introduction. Um, you kind of stole my surprise. <laughs> um, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the uh, organizer for the invitation. As Bill said, my lab studies um, sleep in, in Drosophila. I believe I might be the only speaker for the two days uh, walking on something which is not a mammal. Um, so I'll try to keep it simple or to a uh, diverse audience. <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons why we work on, on flies is because um, I'm uh, um, really fascinated by the evolutionary conservation of sleep. And I think you, you should all too, as well. Um, one of the questions that we have to still address about sleep um, is not just because sleep is present in all animals. As far as we know, that's an, the argument that's been put forward so far. Any animal that has been investigated so far, from jellyfish to whales, show to possess some characteristics of sleep. But the other question together, that comes together with evolutionary conservation um, also has to do with the actual evolutionary variability of sleep in these animals. You have animals uh, throughout the kingdom that sleep as little as four hours a day. We know elephants do, for instance. On the other hand, you have animals like bats, or you know, most commonly cat, if you have a cat at home, that sleep something like 20, 21 hours a day. And so if you want to understand what sleep does, you have to basically come to um, argument with this evidence. You have to try and explain why some animals sleep 21 hours a day and other animals can cope with four hours a day. Uh, any proposal of sleep function has to um, address this point. <clears throat> and uh, um, between elephants, and, and that, somewhere in the middle, is Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, flies, we know, sleep more or less as much as humans. Um, they obviously are a fantastic genetic model, um, and um, their introduction uh, as a sleep model, actually by Chiara's group in the uh, year 2000, um, has really opened a new highway for, for sleep studies, not just in terms of genetics, but also in terms of physiology and sleep function. And so the, the, the question that um, I try to address today um, is, the, is the following one. Is sleep a vital necessity? <clears throat> so what do I mean by vital necessity? Um, it become clear as I talk um, about the experiments we did, but the, a vital necessity for me is um, um, something that is as a cell biological definition. So food is a vital necessity. If you don't eat, you die, okay? So is there a component of sleep that is alike food? We know a lot about the biology of food. We know the role of calories. We know how sugars and other calories get converted into ATP and how this sustains cell biology. Is there an equivalent of the cell biological level of sleep? So this is, is a very important question, uh, I think, that still is highly uh, unaddressed. Um, before I, I get into the, into the results, I want to introduce how um, sleep is studied in flies. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is the system that uh, you might be familiar with. You might have seen this in other talks. Um, it's, a, it's a system called activity monitor. <clears throat> what it does is, in fact, it monitors activity of the animal. Um, when I started my postdoc, this was the only system basically available uh, to study sleeping flies. Um, it's not the case anymore, <clears throat> but it's still probably the most widely used. And conceptually, it dates back to the 60s, um, experiments from Simon Benzer, when Simon Benzer basically created the circadian field. Um, he started looking at um, um, uh, circadian rhythm in, in, in pupae, uh, drosophila pupae, and what he was doing, he was putting animals into uh, elect electro, uh, spectrophotometer cuvettes, so that when an animal will emerge from the pupal case, it will somehow interrupt the, uh, uh, the beam of the spectrophotometer, and the spectrophotometer will record activity on the ticker. And this works conceptually in the very same way. We put flies in a small tube, which is about six centimeters in length. There is cotton on one end, <clears throat> and food on the other end, and the fly can stay in this environment for days, um, technically all their life, as long as they have access to fresh food. And uh, as they live in here, all they can do is move back and forth. When they move back and forth, they interrupt an infrared beam, which they cannot see, but stays a laser exactly in the middle of the tube. And by interrupting the beam, they communicate to the computer that the fly is active. If they're walking, they cannot possibly be asleep. Now, um, this system has been extremely useful for the study of circadian rhythm. You, as you know, you know this, the Nobel Prize for circadian rhythm was basically developed using this system, but it turns out it's not particularly efficient to study sleep. And the reason might be already evident to all of you is that if the flies stay only by one end of the tube, for instance, uh, by the cotton, uh, walking, thinking, dancing, whatever, but not crossing the beam, 
um, then no activity will be recorded and sleep might be overestimated. So for this reason, uh, we, we started uh, working on something that is a bit more, um, will be a bit more um, specific. And um, uh, to cut a long story short, um, we um, produced and published actually a couple of years ago, um, this device that we call Etoscope. An Etoscope is a, a machine that is um, supposed to be used uh, in a high throughput fashion. So you can still use it to study thousands and thousands of flies a day. It's inexpensive. Um, but it has a critical um, advantage over the activity monitor. And that is that it's able to use video tracking to um, look at the flies and see what they're doing at any given point and uh, uh, any given point in time and space. Um, <clears throat> most importantly, what we do is not just uh, um, motion, detector, motion detection, but we actually employ some kinds of um, a basic uh, machine learning to distinguish between um, different patterns of activity. So we can uh, um, find when a fly is walking, like in this case, in the tube. Uh, we can identify when a fly is actually immobile, properly immobile, wherever they are. But we can also detect whether they are feeding, so performing small movements by the foot, or whether they are, for instance, uh, grooming, so cleaning the wings, which is something that, as you know, flies do very often. And uh, <clears throat> this category is what we call micro-movements, and it's really, um, one of the major new features of, of this machine, because we're no longer just able to detect when the flies are walking, but we're able to detect also when they are awake outside of the center of the tube. Um, so when you compare sleep as detected with etoscope to same sleep as detected with activity monitors, this is what the picture you get. So you have on the continuous line uh, sleep recorded with the etoscope, on the dashed line recorded with the infrared beam split or the activity monitor for both males and females. And uh, this is the pattern of a 24 hours. We keep normally animal in 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. And you see that uh, in both cases, uh, you record most of the sleep during the night. Uh, we know that flies are um, crepuscular animals, so they have a pattern of activity um, uh, that is uh, greater at sunset and sunrise. <clears throat> Males uh, have a siesta, which has already been described before. Females do not. But the most striking difference is that um, even though the pattern is similar when you compare etoscope and activity monitor, the amount of sleep is clearly uh, off. And so, for instance, with the activity monitor, you would think that flies sleep something like 80% of the time, while in fact they sleep on average 50% of the time. And female flies have an even striking difference. You would think that they sleep something like 70% of the time, while in fact they sleep less than 25% of the time. And so this is... Uh, um, Interesting, but uh, not surprising, at least for when we did the experiment. It was already shown uh, by other groups uh, doing video tracking analysis uh, by ourselves as well um, about eight years ago. Where it, came really, where it became really interesting is the um, sleep amount um, is, uh, shows a greater variability when properly annotated. And so <clears throat> this is um, a group of um, 485 male flies compared to a group of 881 virgin female flies, for which we record the sleep across several days. And we plot average sleep amount throughout the day uh, in these graphs. Um, as you can see in males, uh, sleep amount ranges from a maximum of 60% in some individuals to something like 20% in slow, uh, low sleeping um, uh, individuals. In females, the difference is even more pronounced. It goes from 40% uh, to something that almost zero. In fact, and this is very surprising, we found animals that sleep at least of three or four minutes a day using this system. And so when I say that no animals has ever been found uh, to appear to be sleepless, I wasn't lying. So we were very excited because this seems to be almost like one of the, uh, the first evidence. Um, if you look at the activity tracking of these animals, you see that uh, they walk a lot during the day. And then during the night, they still keep walking, but they keep walking without crossing the midline of the tube. And so that explains why lots of this activity has never been detected before. So this is, in fact, is one, is the, our shortest sleeping female. And you see that she walks a lot during the day, but then during the night she spends a lot of time by the foot, performing in green what we call micro-movements. Um, we confirm that the location of micro-movements is really important uh, to explain this phenotype. Um, what we do is we plot where, for instance, the walking activity happens throughout the tube. So if this is the position of is the length of the tube, you see the walking is uh, evenly distributed both in male and females along the length of the tube. Um, uh, quiescence, on the other end, has a strong bias. And you see that quiescence actually happens towards the end of the tube, but not quite at the very margin. 
Okay, so they have a, pre a, preference, a preferred spot, which is about 10% throughout the length of the tube by the food side. And finally, micro movements actually happen exactly by the food, especially in females. Um, micro, uh, micro movements happen mostly adjacent to the food. And so w w the reason is that most of those micro movements are actually uh, food related behavior. Right, so um, we done other analysis on this to explain differences between men and females, but I'm not, you know, I don't have the time to show um, those data. Instead, I'll jump on um, the second part of the, of, of, the, of the talk, which is the logical consequence of what we just observed. So we found flies that sleep as little as three, four minutes a day. So the question is, is this a peculiarity of only some lucky or unlucky individuals, or is something that potentially every fly can do? Are, is any fly, in principle, being able to survive with three or four minutes um, of sleep a day? And so uh, the response to this question has to come from studies of sleep deprivation. Uh, sleep deprivation has been, as you know, you know, fundamental for sleep research, um, but it always comes with a caveat. And so when we started this uh, line of experiments, we wanted to address the caveat first. The main caveat of sleep deprivation is that the system we have um, and we, we, we use to perform sleep deprivation are always um, difficult to control. In rodents, for instance, some people use a system like this one where animals are placed on a treadmill and uh, um, they have to walk continuously because otherwise they will get electrocuted. Um, painful, but not little uh, electric shock uh, at the end of the treadmill. Uh, there are other systems, obviously, which are uh, less invasive, but stress is always something that one has to control for. Um, in flies, um, most uh, uh, groups will use uh, just an orbital shaker. You put the uh, flies on the orbital shaker, and then every minute or so, you will give a good shake so that they will um, wake up. Uh, this system is probably less uh, stressful, we don't know, but it's still me mechanically is, is quite invasive. And most of all, uh, it doesn't discriminate between sleeping flies and, um, and wake flies. It just will give a stimulus to everyone. Um, Conceptually, probably the best we come out with is this system, the Discover Water. I assume you're all very familiar with it, so I will not um, go into greater detail. But the good thing bit about the Discover Water is that it will deprive of sleep only the animals when they actually fall asleep. And so we took uh, the Discover Water as an inspiration, and we uh, then modified ethoscopes to uh, perform some kind of sleep deprivation, and it will be a control as much as it is, at least in the Discover Water system. Um, <clears throat> the machines we created have modules that plug on the bottom, and one of these modules, in fact two of these modules, can perform sleep deprivation. Okay, the way it's done is uh, in the simplest form, you have a motor, and the motor is connected with a pulley to the tube, and so basically whenever the um, fly falls asleep, the motor will rotate and the fly will wake up. And um, it looks like this, so if you look at the first flies on the left here, you see that she's not moving for a certain amount of time, you can um, decide how long you want a certain amount of time to be. This is what we call a trigger, and then it should start rotating like this. Okay. Right, so um, first thing we wanted to check is whether uh, this way of performing what we call dynamic sleep deprivation, that is a stimulus only when the flies actually stop moving, uh, would be efficient in terms of uh, rebound. And so we perform a different kind of sleep deprivation in which what we changed was the uh, trigger interval. Okay, so we went as low as 20 seconds, meaning that if the flies don't move for 20 seconds, uh, you rotate the tube, to as long as 1,000 seconds, so that's more than 15 minutes. If the flies don't move for 15 minutes, you rotate the tube, but anything between, the, you still let them sleep. And so we, look, we did 12 hours of sleep deprivation during the night, following a number of intervals between this range, between 20 seconds and 1,000, and the result is here. Uh, you can see the efficiency of sleep deprivation, uh, and no, sorry, uh, in another in, in a graph that I'm, um, is not here, you will have efficiency sleep deprivation, and obviously uh, sleep, efficiency sleep deprivation correlates with the length of the interval. But it's worst, what is most interesting is what you observe in terms of sleep rebound. Okay, so after you uh, interrupt the sleep deprivation after 12 hours, you can look at the rebound and um, quantify rebound, and what you see is that both in males and females you have a rebound that is only partly um, um, linearly uh, correlating with the amount of uh, sleep deprivation that you've caused. So um, for 20 seconds interval, of course, where the sleep deprivation is more efficient, the rebound is higher. This is uh, uh, rebound sleep over the first three hours uh, the following day. But even uh, on 1,000 um, seconds trigger stimuli, you have a rebound. So, Keep in mind, the flies uh, have not very consolidated sleep as much as humans, obviously. And so 
um, in this experiment, you will have only maybe four or five tube rotation per night, because this is the number of uh, bouts of sleep that are actually longer than 1,000 seconds, uh, four or five per individual per night. And yet, you actually see a rebound uh, even after such uh, little uh, disturbance. Okay, so having shown that um, sleep deprivation can lead to rebound in these animals, the next question is, uh, which is you know, the one we open with, um, is chronic sleep deprivation going to be little? Can we kill the flies by just constantly keeping them awake? And, and the, lecture, the literature will tell you yes, uh, based on this um, paper that was published in 2002. Um, in this paper, what they found is that by doing sleep deprivation with, with finger tapping um, on, small, um, on 12 animals, they found that after 60 hours of continuous wakefulness, two of 12 animals actually died. And so um, we performed the experiments using the etoscope, and um, we took male flies, several hundred male flies and female flies, and um, we started sleep deprivation when they were about four days old, and we continued and continued and continued and continued. And by uh, judging from the previous literature, we would expect them to die more or less at this point. While in fact, the experiment went on and on until the natural death. And what we found is that we were not able to kill flies by continuous sleep deprivation. This is done with a 20 seconds uh, trigger. So we will never let the flies be inactive for longer than 20 seconds. Um, in female flies, there was actually a, a very moderate effect on longevity of about uh, three, four days. Uh, in male flies, there was nothing that was statistically relevant. Um, we also performed a kind of Randy Gardner experiment uh, in which we kept flies awake for 10 days to study how sleep pressure builds up in this animal. Um, and so this is the experiment, male flies, female flies, 10 days, interrupt the sleep deprivation after about 10 days and study um, what happens after and during the sleep deprivation. And what we found is that after 10 days of sleep deprivation, the rebound that we observed was really nothing major compared to the 12 hours of sleep deprivation rebound that we've characterized before. It was pretty much the same strength and same magnitude. More interestingly, we found that during those 10 days of sleep deprivation, the natural activity of the animals was uh, not necessarily correlating with building up of sleep pressure that you would expect after 10 days, but it was actually correlating with the circadian activity of the animals. In other words, at crepuscular times, when the animal is supposed to be active, it is active. It doesn't matter that it's been sleep deprived for 10 days in a row at 20 seconds interval. At crepuscular time, you need no stimulus to keep the animal awake. The circadian rhythm will still overwhelmingly uh, do that for job for you. And uh, we confirmed that, and this is my last experiment, uh, by doing the same experiment in uh, clock mutants, uh, both in a regular LD condition or in DD condition. And what you see is that when you look at the number of stimuli, stimuli that we have to give to those animals um, throughout the 10 days, um, in, in, in complete absence of circadian rhythms, this, this number of stimuli becomes um, um, flat, meaning that, again, the, the main stimulus of activity in these animals is not building up of sleep pressure, but um, circadian rhythms. Okay, uh, I'm running a little out of time, so I want you to take home, uh, go home with a take-home me message. Um, so sleep deprivation is... Um, not lethal in flies, whether we induce it or whether we fund it in wild type population. Um, this is, uh, led us to a, a working model that we're now pursuing in the lab. And the working model is the sleep is not just uh, uh, one thing. It's not an unicum, not a uh, unum, but it's actually a, a, a mix of uh, three components. Um, and we, we like to define um, a vital component, uh, which is the one that uh, might really work like food. Uh, we, we still don't know how much of, of the sleep we get or flies get belong to this component, but we can still cannot exclude it. But it, we definitely know that it's, it must be very, very small. Um, a useful component is the one that actually uh, you know, helps your memory, helps your performance, um, uh, keeps you alive if you're driving a car uh, after sleep deprivation. And uh, uh, finally, an accessory component whose role is actually just to maintain a species-specific sleep amount. And so Basically, going back to the original slide on the difference between sleep in bats and sleep in elephant, uh, we propose that the main difference between those four hours and 21 hours between bats and elephant actually nails down to the accessory component. And so if it's uh, easy for us to accept that bats sleep 21 hours just to maintain some kind of uh, species-specific uh, rest condition, why can't we accept that the same applies to all other animals? 
And um, I'd like just to point out the authors of this, uh, most of the work. So uh, Quentin, uh, was now in Canada for his postdoc, just graduated in September, and Esteban, who is in uh, the audience, and the rest of the lab. Thanks. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Giorgio. That was a sensational uh, result. So it should be controversial. We've got we're making the young people in the session work extra fast. They have to speak faster. So um, we've got time for a couple of questions, I think. Um, I can't see. I'm blinded. Hi, Ivana. Glad. Uh, Georgia, you mentioned 21 hours of sleep and beds. Uh, are you sure those data are strong enough? So what are those uh, original studies that show this? Can keep it brief? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's... Um you know, one can always argue about the original studies, but uh, there is enough evidence also from other animals, not necessarily in bat. There is uh, evidence, as you know, in, in cat. There is uh, evidence in koalas. Uh, there is evidence that sleep changes a lot with seasonality, and some animals sleep more during summer time of the day, uh, time of the year than others. So um, I think there is very strong evidence that you know better than me that uh, sleep amount changes a lot between species. Um, whether you, you know, like to call it 19 or 20, the point is still made. Uh, Carl, then we'll, we'll, after this, one more question. Okay, intriguing, thank you. but the, um, there is duration and there is intensity. Yes. So how do you measure arousal threshold in your, um, in your animals? Yeah, so basically what we do is we measure the number of stimuli as a proxy for arousal intensity, arousal threshold, because uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you, you can imagine that if an animal has a low arousal threshold, then just one stimulus will be enough to wake them up. Um, but if they have a stronger arousal threshold, higher arousal threshold, then you need uh, two consecutive, for instance, tube rotation to wake them up. So the number of tube rotation correlates with arousal okay, threshold. Okay, one last question, Ivan. Well, I can argue that even if you had intraelectrical uh, um, electrodes, you would still be asking the same question, right? Because those are just correlates, same as activity. Uh, co activities are correlated as much as electro electrophysiology. Um, yes, I mean, it's technically possible that they sleep and walk. Um, but again, you know, I could make the point about any animal model or even human model we, we study. So I'll give you a brief um, okay. I, I think it's very unlikely that that's the condition. I mean, uh, especially, uh, for instance, at, at when at circadian times when they're mostly active, they just do what you expect them to do, so feed and, and walk around and groom. So, you know, they will really have to be zombies to be able to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.